Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the vertebral artery. We're going to talk about some of its functions, but mainly we're going to be talking about the course that it takes after originating from the subclavian artery, and we'll see what happens to both the right and the left vertebral arteries as they surpass the cervical vertebrae. So before we get into all this here with the vertebral artery, let's do a little bit of review of anatomy of the superior part of the heart. So remember on the superior part, we have the arch of the aorta, or the aortic arch. Now the aortic arch has three vessels that come off of it, three large arteries. The first one is the brachiocephalic artery. That's actually this artery right here. Okay. Uh, we can see a portion of it at the bottom of the picture. The other two in order would be the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. Now, this brachiocephalic artery, you can see, very quickly uh, diverges, bifurcates into two other large arteries. So here's brachiocephalic artery. The first one up here, which isn't labeled, is the right common carotid artery. And then this one would be the right subclavian artery. Okay. Um, on the left side, uh, remember the left common carotid and the left subclavian branch directly off of the arch of the aorta, whereas over here the right subclavian and right common carotid actually branch off of this intermediate brachiocephalic artery. Okay? But any way you look at this, whether you're looking at the right side or the left side, this vessel right here, the vertebral artery, always branches off of the subclavian artery. So this is the right subclavian artery. That makes this the right vertebral artery. Okay? Uh, the only thing you have to remember, if you're going back a little bit, is where the subclavian artery comes from on either side. On the right side, it's from the brachiocephalic artery. On the left side, it's directly from the arch of the aorta. Okay? but for the vertebral artery. So the vertebral artery is called such because it traverses really right next to the cervical vertebrae. In fact, it actually goes through these holes on either side of each of the cervical vertebrae called transverse foramina. Foramina is plural, foramen is singular. And to really get a good look at that, let's actually go to this picture. Okay, so let's actually count the cervical vertebrae. So here's C1, this is the atlas, the top one. This one below it is C2, the axis. We can actually see the odontoid process of the dens actually sticking up from C2 right here. This is C1, C2, and then we have C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. Now, if you look at all of these cervical vertebrae, and we can see it really well on the top one, the atlas, you'll notice on either side, there's these transverse processes that stick out, and actually every vertebra has transverse processes, but in the cervical spine, these transverse processes have holes, and these holes within the transverse processes are called transverse foramina. So this one over here, since we're looking at an anterior view, this is the right transverse foramen, and this over here would be the left transverse foramen. Now what's interesting about the vertebral artery is you'll notice that right after it comes off of the subclavian artery, it actually enters this network of transverse foramina. Okay? Now, as I mentioned, all seven cervical vertebrae have transverse foramina on each side. However, the vertebral artery is going to do something interesting after it comes off of the subclavian artery. So the vertebral artery doesn't particularly like C7. Okay? Maybe C7 resembles too much of a thoracic vertebrae. Who knows? Or maybe it just doesn't like it. Okay? So the vertebral artery does not actually enter the transverse foramen of C7, it skips it and goes directly to C6. So you'll notice that this vertebral artery goes into the transverse foramen at C6, but not at C7. Okay? The transverse foramen for C7 is kind of right here, it's a little bit covered up by C6, but it skips C7 and goes directly to C6. So that's very important to understand. Okay? Um, and it goes from C6, C5, C4, C3, C2, and C1. Okay? and it goes just through those transverse foramina on that side, okay? Now, something interesting happens at the level of C2, the axis, okay? You'll notice that whenever the vertebral artery exits from that transverse foramen of the axis, it seems to undergo a little curvilinear path, really from the top of the axis through the atlas and then all the way up to where it fuses up here with the contralateral vertebral artery. Um, and we can actually get a better view of that on this picture. So this is important. 
So right here where my mouse is, that's the transverse process of C2, and then the transverse foramen would be um, inside that. So whenever this vertebral artery emerges superiorly from that transverse foramen of C2, notice that it actually goes anteriorly. And here's your nose, eyes, mouth, so this is anterior. So it actually moves anteriorly on its way to the C1 transverse process. So when you look at the vertebra as they're normally stacked, uh, notice that the transverse foramen of C1 is actually a little bit anteriorly placed relative to the rest of these transverse foramen. So in order to get to the C1 transverse foramen, that vertebral artery is going to have to uh, move a little bit anteriorly as it goes up. Then it's going to go through that transverse foramen of C1 and immediately move posteriorly. And actually, in a neutral neck position, it's actually going to move posteriorly and a tad inferiorly. But really what it's doing as it courses posteriorly, it's moving along the length of the atlas. So it's going parallel to the atlas. And then when it gets about to the halfway point of the atlas, it's going to curve back up and go superiorly. Okay, so that's the course that the vertebral artery takes from C2. It goes anteriorly and superiorly from C2 to C1. It's going to curve back a little bit inferiorly, and then when it gets to about the halfway point of the atlas, it's going to curve back up, and it's actually going to fuse with the contralateral vertebral artery. And again, that's something we can see better here. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So we have C2, C1. It doesn't look like that in this picture, but actually the vertebral artery is curving, remember, superiorly and anteriorly to get to C1. And then from C1 up, it's curving posteriorly. And you can see here it's actually moving along the length of the atlas right here. And then at about the halfway point, it's then going to curve up. Now you'll notice that this is the right vertebral artery, but the left one is also doing the same thing, just on the left side. Okay. Now, once it gets to that point where it starts to curve up on both sides, those vertebral arteries are going to move toward one another and they're going to converge. Okay. So this region right here of the vertebral artery, um, after it's kind of curved up from the atlas, this is called the intracranial part of the vertebral artery. Remember that the skull sits on top of the atlas. So those superior facets of the atlas, they house the occipital condyles of the skull, and so the skull sits on it. But the vertebral artery actually enters the skull, it enters the cranium. So this region of the vertebral artery is the intracranial part. And very quickly after it enters the cranium, the two are going to meet up and fuse. And so when the vertebral arteries fuse, they form what's called the basilar artery. Okay, here's the basilar artery. Uh, the basilar artery, therefore, is a convergence or a fusion of the two vertebral arteries. And that means also that there is no left and right basilar artery. There is just the basilar artery. Sometimes when you want to collectively refer to the vertebral arteries and the basilar artery because they are closely related, you can call it the vertebral basilar artery system. Okay, you kind of fuse the two words, so to speak, vertebral basilar artery. Okay, but the basilar artery is a separate artery. It's just a fusion of these two. Okay. Now, other than just forming the basilar artery, uh, there are some other functions of the vertebral artery while it's still in the cervical spine. You'll notice here with the picture, um, there's some muscular branches that come off. Okay? Um, the muscular branches are there to supply some of the deep neck musculature. Now, I've got videos on my channel where we go over that deep musculature. One of those muscles, for example, is longus colli. Okay, or longus colli. Um, some of those muscles are supplied partially by the vertebral artery. Okay? Um, most only have a very minor supply from the vertebral artery. Uh, they usually have other um, supplies that really come off of the thyrocervical trunk indirectly, um, but they do have some contribution from the vertebral arteries, okay, from these muscular branches. Um, that's sort of a minor function of the vertebral artery is those muscular branches that supply some of the deep neck musculature. Um, but another very important function, very important, is the spinal branch. You can barely see it right there. Um, if you think about it, the vertebral artery is in very close proximity to the spinal cord, right? Because remember, within here, this is the vertebral canal, so the spinal cord runs down there. A very important function of the vertebral artery is that it actually gives off spinal branches. You can see right there. You can barely see the artery. Um, but if you think about it, the vertebral artery is in very close proximity to the spinal cord, right? Because within here, this is the vertebral canal. 
where the spinal cord runs down. So the vertebral artery is going to give off an anterior spinal artery and posterior spinal arteries. Okay? And those arteries just supply the spinal cord with blood. The spinal cord is a living tissue, right? Um, we think of it in terms of conducting nerves down toward uh, the extremities or maybe sensory nerves up toward the brain, but it's a living tissue. It has to have blood, and that blood is largely supplied by those anterior and posterior spinal arteries that come off of the vertebral artery. Okay, so other than talking about the course of the vertebral artery as it goes up from the subclavian artery, um, hopefully you understand three major functions of the vertebral artery. Number one, the left and the right vertebral arteries fuse up here to form the basilar artery, which we'll talk about in a later video as forming uh, what we actually call the circle of Willis, partially. And then it also gives off muscular branches to some deep neck muscles, and then also gives off the anterior and posterior spinal arteries. So hopefully that makes sense to you, and hopefully you learned about the vertebral artery. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.